What's up guys and welcome back to another episode of Headphones Neil Reviews. I'm your host as always, Headphones Neil, bringing you my review and episode for this week's set of stuff. So I'm going to have the usual reviews of um, the latest episode of Ahsoka and my update on Stargate SG-1. Um, I did have a chance to finish playing Brutal Wolfenstein so I'll have the review of that. Um, this week's additional reviews are going to be a film review and my um, ongoing monthly review for um, Knott's Berry Farm, so to get it started, um, I did have a chance to watch Oppenheimer last week, finally, and I do want to say that it is worth watching as a film, it's very well done, at three hours long it does um, encompass a lot of information, um, a lot of character building, the development of the weapon, the, um, um, the growth of Oppenheimer, his various um, affiliations, his training, his education, abilities, his thought process and all of that so overall I can see why it got the rating it did um, it is in like the 90s but then also the uh, high praise that it's been getting so if you haven't seen it yet I definitely recommend watching it it does cover um, the rise of Oppenheimer his time with the Manhattan Project his personal um, issues and time and um, growth that he went through um, and then the scrutiny he went under um, once the bombs went off, and uh, why he thought that it shouldn't they shouldn't continue to be developed, and all of that. So um, definitely a good film to watch. It is a very star-studded cast. So aside from the guy who plays Oppenheimer, you have um, Robert Downey Jr. in there, um, Florence Pugh, among many, many, many other people. So definitely check out the cast list. Uh, Matt Damon's in there, which got me to thinking why. Um, or like at some point in the movie, I'll also begin to wonder why, like Ben Affleck and Tom Hanks, um, or Harrison Ford weren't in there because they would definitely fit the profile of some of those characters as far as being able to cast them. But definitely watch the film, characters aside and the people who play them aside. I definitely recommend giving it a watch. It's very well produced. Um, like I said, at three hours long, it gives every all the stories a, a chance to grow and develop all the characters to interact and all of that stuff so a uh, definite recommendation for me for that now for this week's not or this month's not very farm review um i was gonna do a separate episode for it but because it's one of those things where i it would be detrimental to do its own episode i thought i would roll it into here i still did the blog post for um compiling the photos and videos from the trip but because September is kind of that intermediary month between summer and the end of the year holidays, um, you don't really have too much going on. They do start taking away a lot of the Ghost Town Live stuff and Boysenberry stuff and then transitioning over into the um, Halloween stuff and then they follow that directly with uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. So that's why like that if you visit in September, it's actually a good time to go because you don't have much going on if you just want to go to the park for rides hang out relax then it's a good time to go especially during the weekdays which is what we had a chance to do on this trip so for the hundred year um segment for this month i got to thinking well it's an amusement park everyone's into fitness how would you get, go around the park to t get ten thousand steps now you would think, well, Knott's Berry Farm is not nearly as big as, you know, Disneyland, California Adventure, even Six Flags Magic Mountain, possibly even Universal Studios. So is it even possible? Is it doable or anything like that? And I will say that it is possible with a couple of caveats. So if you're on the older side and you're not able to go on roller coasters, then you would have to spend more time going around the park. So. It depends on if you have that time or desire to, you know, walk around the park like um, six, five or six times potentially. But if you do are able to go online or on rides, then by walking around the park, so 
or to, to backtrack a little bit, in order to get the 10,000 steps, um, you know, you could go randomly zigzag across the park. So go from Ghost Rider to Accelerator, then to Pony Express, to Jaguar and things like that. If you go all over the place like that, then it's probably a lot easier. But if you want to go on a more structured route, then my recommendation is to first go in a clockwise or counterclockwise uh, route around the outside of the park. So, you know, start in Ghost Town, go all the way towards the back through the boardwalk, um, around to Camp Snoopy and back to the front or vice versa. Then go around the middle areas of the park. So, you know, the areas by the log ride and the Calico train and then the various shops and stuff in Ghost Town and go on, go in all those areas, go shopping and do a look at a lot of that stuff. And then along the way, also go on the various rides. So if it's a normal day where, you know, it's a little bit busy and you're waiting in line, then the queue that you, queues that you wait in for like um, Ghost Rider and Jaguar will help you get your steps in because those queues are relatively long compared to some of the other ones. Um, Ghost Rider, or not Ghost Rider, Silver Bullet and Hang Time are also a little bit up there, but they're also a little bit shorter, so not quite as easy to get as many steps in. But if you go through those lines, then you're going to get the steps in. Um, this time around, we did not go on the water ride, so the log ride or Calico River Rapids. But the the queues for the queue for Calico River Rapids is actually pretty long. So if you go on that ride, you're going to get your steps in. The log ride is a little bit shorter, but you can get your um, steps in there as well. So. Things like that will help out a lot. So as you walk around the park, go on all the rides for the queues, then that's it'll definitely help you get there. So we did end up going on all the major rides. So we went on Ghost Rider, Hang Time, Silver Bullet, um, and Jaguar. We didn't go on Pony Express because it was closed. And then same thing with Accelerators. I think it was undergoing testing, not the day we went, but um, there are videos up on YouTube, YouTube showing that they're testing it. Montezuma's Revenge is still down, so you can't go on that. But if you go on um, the, I, I think it's Coast Riders or whatever at the back of the park in the boardwalk area, then that queue has a little bit of a, a few steps you can get in. So things like that. So if you go on all the rides and go in the, go through the queues on a normal day, then it's pretty easy to get your 10,000 steps in. Granted, not as easy as uh, Disneyland, for example. Cause I want to say like if you go a couple times around Disneyland, it'll definitely get your steps in. So one of those things to consider. But um, if you enjoy Knott's Berry Farm, but and also want to get in your steps, then that's the easiest way to do it. If you're on the older side, or if you have you know knee problems or leg problems or can't move around as as much, or you know maybe you can't stay out in the sun that long, then it will take a little bit longer to do that, or it'll be that much harder to do it. So. If your um, expectations are a little bit different where you need want to only go for 5,000 steps or a couple of miles, then it's pretty easy to just go around the park, the outside of the park a couple of times, or even just go around the outside of the park, But or even if you're just going through, you know, Ghost Town to walk through there, check out all the shops, and then you go on over to Camp Snoopy with the kids and walk through that area, you'll get your steps in there. Um, and then if you go through the midway to play the um, different games, if you go in the queue for, and oh, we did go on Berry Tales as well, but if you go on Berry Tales, that queue during on a normal uh, business day where there's enough people, that queue is long enough as well, so you'll get your steps in there. So um, it's not that it's impossible to do, but it does have the caveats on having to go on all those different rides in order to get your steps in. So. It was a fun little side project for this month that, you know, for recommendations with our friends to go to the park. I was like, let's see if we can do it. How easy or hard is it to do? We figured that it would be not be that hard because there would be longer lines and the queues would be long. But also, as it turns out, the park was not too busy when we went. So all the queues were super short. So on the blog post that's linked in the show notes, you'll see that a lot of the rides were walk-on, so even like Ghost Rider, or especially like Ghost Rider and Jaguar, we went straight to the queues and there was like no line for Ghost Rider, no line for Silver Bullet or Jaguar. Uh, Barry Tales was a little bit of a wait just because um, the load unload um, times for that ride are a little bit on the weird side. It's always a little bit on a little bit slow, so there's always a wait there. Um, but then like, um, 
we didn't and like I said, we didn't go on the log ride or calico river rapid so we're not sure how the weights were there but for the most part all the big roller coasters had almost no line so the queues were shorter than they would normally be so um there's that and same thing for the calico mine ride um i think we got on the first or second train on walking on that line so um that was also pretty much a walk on so um, like I said, September is a downtime, so it's kind of hard to get your 10,000 steps in. But if you just want to go around the park and to get, you know, steps in on, in a relatively easy way, and you're not going to go on any rides, and the park is easy to get through, you know, go through Ghost Town for those shops and that stuff, and Camp Snoopy will cover most of it, and then, you know, go through the boardwalk to just get the experience of going through the boardwalk, pass by the midway, and um, all of that stuff. Um, so with that being said, uh, moving on to the usual stuff for this week, um, I did have a chance to watch Ahsoka Season 1 Episode 5 Shadow Warrior. So we have a two-part, um, two-fold thing going on in this episode where the side thing is we have um, Hera trying to figure out with her son and Chopper um, and the X-Wing guys what happened to Sabine and um, Ahsoka. Um, so they're doing their um, usual, um, just their you know search and uh, analysis and reconnaissance and all of that, um, without the um, New Republic knowing about it. And then on the flip side, we have um, Ahsoka in the Worlds Beyond Worlds um, interacting with Anakin to find out find out why she's there, what's going on, and it coming down to. The basic idea of him asking her does she want to live or die so um the their conversations were great their interactions were great um it was great to see a live action ahsoka interacting with a live action um anakin we have a trip down memory lane so we have um um them fighting each other in battle as practice and then we also have um, the memory of Ahsoka during the Siege of Mandalore and Anakin not remembering that to tie into the end of the Clone Wars animated series. So, and then we have more um, of young Ahsoka um, fighting the droids and all that. So we got to see that, which was pretty cool. We got to see a live action Captain Rex. Um, and then we got to see um, Anakin as Darth Vader to fight um, Ahsoka and his lightsaber um, battles and all that. And... I think the most telling part of that conversation was um, that Anakin was trained um, during a time of peace to be a warrior, um, while um, all Ahsoka has ever known growing up was war, so she doesn't know anything else, so it, does, so it all depends on what she wants and what she wants to teach her Padawan. So I think it's they set that all up to ultimately take um, between that and Hera's son having an affinity for the Force and hearing the lightsabers, that I think they were setting up this episode to have Hera's son be Ahsoka's um, Padawan and also to teach her the lesson that just because the Jedi are no more doesn't end there and that everyone's training is a matter of circumstance. So kind of give a little bit more context to her conversation with Luke and um the mandalorian as far as why she's not a jedi why she doesn't want to train anyone and does she want to live or die and how does she want to live on going forward so a very good episode it was at like almost 50 minutes so longer than the past few episodes and i can see why they wanted to present this on the big screen it was all very well done and it definitely does warrant a rewatch so like i said definitely worth watching it's really good content if you I mean, I recommend watching all of Ahsoka, but if you don't watch anything else, definitely watch this episode, Shadow Warrior. Um, it def it does connect um, the Clone Wars to the original trilogy, to Ahsoka, to the um, Rebels and all of that. So there was a lot of stuff going on and definitely is worth a watch. Um, as far as the Stargate SG-1 watch through goes, I am up to se season seven. I'm in the middle of that. I just got through the episodes where Dr. Frazier dies in the battle and the camera crew that's at SGC and dealing with all of that and how the that guy is dead a lot worse than uh, Martin was as far as the crew that stole, stole the Prometheus that the guy is generally insensitive and or he comes across and says insensitive even though 
Um, by the end of it, he's not really that way, but he comes across that way. So it's one of those things where um, it's probably the most dramatic episode or one of the most dramatic two part episodes of Stargate SG-1. Definitely hard to watch because you do lose the character of Dr. Frazier. She's been with the show since the beginning. So, um, I mean, it's up there as far as hard to watch on the level of losing Dr. Jackson as well to the radiation. So, um, well, is it the definitive Stargate SG-1 episode? Probably not. But when you're losing a character like Dr. Frazier, who's been with the um, team for since the beginning, pretty much that... It is a hard couple of episodes to watch, so that's that's as far as I've gotten so far. So, um, but I said, like I said, definitely worth a watch, and I do recommend uh, watching the episodes and the season just to catch up on all that. But otherwise, you know, we're de also dealing with the breakdown in the alliance between the human Tokra and Jaffa, so that has to be rebuilt. Dealing with Anubis and his super soldiers, so. Um, we have a lot of that stuff still going all on along with or in the context of Dr. Frazier's death. So um, that's kind of where we're at in the progression of events of the show overall. So with that, we're going to round out this week's episode with um, Brutal Wolfenstein 3D. So I did have a final I did finally have a chance to finish the third episode, Die, Fear or Die. So in this case, the whole level is geared toward your confrontation with um, Mega Hill, I forget if it's Mega Hill Hitler or Mecha Hitler, but essentially um, he's been doing all these experimentations. He's authorized the creation of zombies. You have these faster officers in the final level. Um, so by the time you get to the final level to face off against Hitler, you're dealing with him uh, who has four or a suit of four chain guns. So think of. Um, like the Hitler version of um, Lex Luthor in his suit, so you have to deal with that. And then um, you also he also has these ghost specter looking things that you have to ultimately fight. And then you have flamethrower dudes so, um, throughout the whole um, episode. So there's a lot of stuff going on, but overall it was... I want to say it was actually also one of the best um, episodes just because it's the most diverse as far as level goes. Episode two was good just because it was a whole that scientist lab and it felt more unique and distinct. But in this case, it was it had a good variety as well. So um, a good set of episodes or a good set of levels there, and a good conclusion to the trilogy of um, levels to uh, beat the game. And then they do set up at the end to set up. Um, I think there was a prequel, a Spear, a Spear of Destiny, and then there was a sequel called Night of something or other. I forget what it's called. So I haven't decided if I'm going to play those or not. Um, overall, the game was good enough, but uh, like in my previous reviews, I think I mentioned that the levels do seem to kind of get repetitive after a while. They're all basically the same set of, or similar, just different mazes and then different color palettes. So. It does get a little bit, you know, boring and dull. It doesn't, and then you're, you know, inside buildings for most of it. So it does kind of start to feel a little bit claustrophobic and repetitive and not too much going on. So it's hard to differentiate between levels compared to a level like Doom, which as its successor does expand on it. The, le the levels are more unique and differentiated and um, enough to keep you going through all of them because they are that unique. So. Uh, maybe Spear of Destiny and the, the, the prequel and the sequel fix that, but the get Wolfenstein game on its own, um, for its time, it was definitely revolutionary and groundbreaking. But even playing it now with Brutal Doom, Brutal Doom improves the visuals of, to, of it to make them more unique, but eventually it does feel like you're going down another set of random hallways to get to the end to get the key and then go to the next level which is more of the same so um for me if i was to decide between the two i would probably lead a little bit more towards doom just because of the variety of levels and gameplay and all that but if you want something more on the or something that's less on the demonic side and you just you want more humans and a little bit of zombies for a little while then wolfenstein 3d would be the way to go and I mean, maybe the later Wolfenstein games like Return to Castle Wolfenstein might fix that a little bit. But as far as Wolfenstein 3D goes, um, the game is fine. I'd probably give it a solid B, like 80 to 85 percent. 
it was entertainment entertaining enough um you have the end level summaries of what happened and what's coming next the boss fights were good where you pick up different guns and you have to take out these overpowered individuals compared to what you were fighting on the in that episode so um there's that as well and you can see how doom took what wolfenstein 3d did and expanded on it quite a bit so that's all there is for this particular episode so if you have any questions comments feedback or anything like that you can um, comment on this post on social media by visiting the website at headphonesneal.reviews which also has links to past episodes subscription links supporting the show and all of that and as a patreon or as a patron you get early access to um, the show as well as an ad-free version of it early access to the video version as well so um that can all be or you can support the show and subscribe to that on the patreon at patreon.com slash patel n01 but that is all for this particular episode thanks for tuning in and until next time